Good morning. And welcome to Christ's King on this beautiful July morning. I'm, I'm wondering, years ago, July was a big month uh, when people got married. By chance, anybody out here uh, ever ha get married in July? If you did, stand up. We just want to stand up. Oh, look, let's, let's give these guys a big round of applause. Happy anniversary. I've learned not to ask how many years, so congratulations. Um, once again, you're all invited to share in the Sacrament of Holy Communion, and you can pick those cups up outside our entrances if you haven't gotten those. We're trying to keep up on the rules, and they seem to be changing, you know, so we're not really sure where we're at, but um, it has been rumored that next week we'll actually have hymnals in the pews. Ooh, yeah, okay, well... So we're, we're, we're trying. Um, yesterday we had a celebration of life for uh, Nate Allgaard, and I just wanted to thank everybody who helped out. It was a very good event and very well received. So thank you for all of those who, who volunteered. Um, oh, I see that Sandy Knutson has an announcement. Um, let's give her a hand as Sandy comes up. I don't know. There you go. Good morning. I just wanted to make an announcement about the upcoming 33rd Annual Synodical Women's Convention that will be held this year on Friday and Saturday, September 17th and 18th, and it is going to be held right here at Christ the King Lutheran Church. And please consider attending this wonderful event. We have several workshops, Bible study, communion worship, and a special celebration to honor the 50th anniversary of the ordination of women in the ministry of the ELCA. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Jacqueline Busi, the new executive director of the Collegeville Institute, located on the grounds of St. John's Abbey and University in central Minnesota. She is an award-winning author, speaker, public theologian, and former religion professor at Concordia College in Moorhead, Minnesota. The um, program for After the Banquet is going to be a panel of ordained women in ministry answering questions about their experiences, and one of the panel members will be Michelle Jensen, and um, registration forms can be found in our office. The cost to attend the whole convention is $100, but you can also just attend the banquet on Friday night or uh, just Saturday, whatever fits your schedule. So I encourage you all to pick up a registration form and plan to attend. Thank you. Thanks, Sandy. Just a reminder that uh, at the uh, conclusion of worship, we will have coffee and muffins if you'd like to stay. Let's pause for a moment to prepare hearts and minds for worship. Stoop down and drink and live. 
I came to Jesus and I drank of the life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, your morn shall rise, and all your day be bright. I look to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my sun. And in that light of life I'll walk till traveling days are done. Let us together confess our sin. God of mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name, amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord of mercy, help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God, power and rich.
riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are his. This is the feast of victory for our God. for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray together our prayer of the day. Let us pray. O oh God, powerful and compassionate, you shepherd your people, faithfully feeding and protecting us. Heal each of us and make us whole people, that we may embody the justice and peace of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now let us hear the word of God. The first reading this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who shepherd my people. It is you who have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. So I will attend to you for your evil doings, says the Lord. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the lands where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them, and they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing, says the Lord. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of God. <clears throat> also, our psalm this morning is Psalm 23. Let's read responsibly. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord is my God, my pastures, and he me the You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. The second reading comes from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision uncircumc by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens 
from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might recon reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. This is the Holy Gospel, according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. We have a long reading today, so I invite you to sit down, unless you want to stand up. Okay. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure time to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went to shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send them away so that we may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy some things for ourselves to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. They said to him, are we to go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves have you? Go and see. When they had found out, they said five and two fish. Then Jesus ordered them to give all the people, to get all the people to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and of fifties. Taking five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all, and all ate and were filled. And then took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and the fish and those who had eaten the loaves numbered 5,000 men. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gerasat and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and they rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard that he was. And wherever he went, into villages, or cities, or farms, 
They laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, for all the ways that you feed us, we give you thanks. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I want you to think about uh, this as I begin, to put in your mindset. Um, yesterday we had uh, a celebration of life like a funeral. We had many people here and uh, we fed them, which takes a lot of work. What's the largest number of people that have ever eaten over at your house? Think about this. How many people have you ever had over to your house that have eaten there for Christmas, for Thanksgiving, party? I'm just wondering. More than 12? More than 20? More than 30? Anybody have any more than 50? Oh, man, okay. So you understand all the time and the effort and the energy and the money that goes into preparing for something like that. But none of us, I would assume, have ever fed over 5,000 men. They left out women and they left out children as many people. Now Jesus fed a group of 5,000 or more hungry people. Verse 40 says this, and they all were satisfied and they had 12 extra baskets of fish and bread left over. It's a feast that Jesus had for these hungry people. Last week, if you were here, I talked about a feast that King Herod had for his guests, and there it was different. And so just hang with me here. I want to, to compare the feast of King Herod to the feast of Jesus, comparing the two kingdoms. Now, Herod throws a party for himself on his birthday. Jesus throws a party for the hungry in the name of God. Herod plots and murders John the Baptist. Jesus' disciples are commanded to serve the masses. Herod prepares a feast for his honored guests. Jesus feeds the dishonest or the dishonored masses. Herod serves up John the Baptist's head on a platter. Jesus serves the hungry until they are satisfied. Purposefully, St. Mark, who wrote this gospel, writes about this miracle and, and talks about how these over 5,000 were fed, but also, also, we get a glimpse into the feast yet to come. Now, this gospel has a lot of things in it, and I'm trying to focus as best I can, so just give me a second. Um, we could focus on a lot of different things, and I've heard many different ser sermons on um, Let's focus on Jesus feeding people and thank God that we are not those hungry f people. We could tell a story. I could talk about how we should take action, how we should go over to the Madison area, to the neighborhood uh, church there, and we could go today and feed some hungry people. Oh, by the way, they are doing a fundraiser. If you go to our Facebook page, you can see that and help if you'd like. Hungry people... Are not, the, are not only in Africa or Central America, they are here living amongst us. And if you would like to see this, I would challenge you, you can do it in a half an hour. Drive around and look at dumpsters. You can do it in Moorhead, you'll have more success downtown Fargo, and you'll see people right now, I guarantee it, who are going through the dumpster looking for food. But besides the challenges of feeding a hungry world, could there be something else in this gospel that God is trying to communicate to us, that God is trying to, to tell us to be and to do? In the gospels of Matthew and Luke and John, the other gospels, the word apostle is used only after the resurrection of Jesus. The word apostle replaces the word disciple. 
Do you want to learn something today? Do you want to learn something? <laughs> what is, why is that? Well, the word apostle literally means sent, sent out. But Mark does not wait until after the resurrection to call the disciples apostles. Verse 30 says, The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done. The verse right before that, verse 29, Mark, Mark uses the word disciple. And the next verse, he uses the word Apostle, the apostles gathered around Jesus. Well, why does he do that? I'll, I'll show you the distinction. The disciples have been sent out, given all authority and power by Jesus to go out and tell the people about Christ, and they had just come back, and here were the results. Verse 31, many now came to see Jesus. Verse 33, many saw him coming. Verse 34, there was a great crowd. Verse 55, the whole region rushed to see Jesus. Mark is trying to tell us something. Tell us that to be a disciple, to be a follower of Jesus, meant that you are no longer a disciple when you have gone out, when you've been sent out to tell and show the world about Jesus Christ. The disciples became apostles the moment that they were set out. Now here's, here's the difference. Disciples, they learn. They passively listen. And then they take it in. And the apostles teach what they have learned. Do you understand? Uh, okay, so if you're, if anybody's considering being a pastor, raise your, no, uh, Here's what happens when we go to seminary after college. You spend two years studying, and after those two years, they send you out on something called an internship. Have you ever had an intern here, maybe? Okay, and then you come back and study another year, and then they, they send you out again. They send you out after you have learned what it takes to be an apostle. Here's my question now. Are you ready? How much of what we do at Christ the King is about being sent out? How <clears throat> outwardly focused are we? How apostle-like are we? <clears throat> we have worship today. We have a good crowd. I would gather to venture that the majority here are members. When we do our education for children, do we go out in the neighborhood? And do we invite people in? When we have uh, Bible studies, circles, all sorts of other things, how many people there are from the outside? Now, there is one exception I know that the quilters do have people from outside that aren't members. So good job, quilters. But we are acting like we're disciples and not acting like we're apostles. And why is that? Jesus' intent was to teach through his words and examples what the kingdom of God is, and then send us out as apostles to do the same to others. The student becomes the teacher. Now, we have been talking here at Christ the King for a couple years about a vision that was cast when this church started. And it has reemerged time and time again, and it's reemerging again, and that is this to know Christ and to make Christ known. To know Christ and to make Christ known. Say that. To know Christ and to make Christ known. We're awesome at getting to know Christ. We just have, need a little work on to make Christ known. Everybody sitting here today and the people who are watching, at home are called to know Christ, but we're also called to make Christ known. It was the same calling that Jesus had, that Jesus was given by God. <clears throat> Call people to know the Father, and then send people to make the Father known. It's not that complicated. Let me give you another example of how Christ calls us from disciple to apostle. 
Jesus is a great shepherd of the sheep. Correct? Right? Okay. We agree on that? We are sheep called, or what are sheep called to do? I didn't grow up on a sheep farm, but I don't know if they do a lot. They're to follow the shepherd who leads them into green pastures besides still waters. Sheep are not inanimate objects. They're not like plants or rocks or trees. Sheep are moving. They're on the move. They're going from green pastures to still water, through valleys of death to the promised land. Sheep are not stagnant. And their purpose is to follow their shepherd. In our cases, that shepherd is Jesus Christ. So, you ready? <clears throat> what if in the kingdom of God, where the sheep know their shepherd, know his voice, he is calling them to become apostles to make Christ known. Being sheep called to something greater, making Christ known. The disciples were chosen, they were taught, and they were called by Jesus. And they became apostles sent out to make Christ known to others. The sheep become the shepherd. People who were healed by Jesus became believers. And then what did they do? They ran out and they told their friends and families they made Christ known. Jesus' disciples on today's gospel or the feeding of the 5,000, they served the hungry that day illustrating what it means to become apostle, to know Christ and then to make Christ known. What if the followers of Jesus, okay, you ready for this? What if the followers of Jesus are simultaneously sheep and shepherd? Shepherds who are called to know Christ and to make Christ known as apostles. Jesus not, not only healed many people who touched the fringe of his cloak, he also set the example for all of us who were to follow him. So you say to me, <clears throat> shepherd, I'm good at being a sheep. Who am I to be a, a, a shepherd? That must be somebody else. I, you know, I leave it to somebody else. Really? Let me remind you, the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, strange things happen. Sheep become shepherds, the last the f become the first, the hungry become satisfied, disciples become apostles. Have you ever, in your life, had the chance to shepherd anyone? Somebody in your family? As a parent, as a grandparent, as an aunt, as an uncle, as a sibling, as a cousin, haven't you ever had a chance to shepherd a member of your family. Anybody have a friend? <laughs> have you ever had a friend go through a time when they couldn't shepherd themselves and you stepped in to help them? That's an apostle. We are all sheep who follow the great shepherd. He is calling his sheep to become apostles, and not just ordinary shepherds, not just ordinary apostles. Jesus, Jesus' shepherds shepherd differently than the world. Jesus' shepherds shepherd the sheep without domination, nor intimidation, nor manipulation, but with compassion. Jesus' shepherds shepherd with commitment, with shared values, with trust, and with concern for their neighbor. Jesus' shepherd shepherd by giving every sheep, not only the honored ones, the confidence that they need to make, to know that they make a difference. And Jesus shepherds shepherd in a way where everyone can experience the life-giving, the life-thriving, the life-empowering, the life-liberating power of God. 
In a world that is life-sucking, discouraging, continuously in conflict, where the strong prey on the weak, Jesus is calling his sheep to become apostles, sent out to shepherd a hurting and vulnerable world. That hurting world is here, is now, is among us. We don't have to go anywhere to find hungry people eating out of dumpsters. We just have to look out our windows. They're right here. When the apostles went out and served others, they did so with compassion. They did not have to recruit people to follow Christ. They did not have to put flyers on neighborhoods' doors. They did not have to advertise. They simply shepherded people. And it is said that people flocked to them, many, great, whole region from every village, every city, every farm. They ran to Jesus. Do not underestimate the power, power of a shepherd. For shepherds have been known to shepherd multitudes of sheep over the centuries, both honored as well as dishonored ones. The great shepherd of the sheep is leading, is calling his sheep to the kingdom of God. The kingdom where a banquet is prepared. A kingdom where there are green pastures beside still waters. A kingdom where the hungry are fed. A kingdom where souls are restored. A kingdom where the sheep shall be satisfied. The kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for being sheep of your fold and being shepherds as well. Give us the courage to be apostles, to reach out through our words and our deeds to a hurting world. And on this day, we give to you all the glory, honor, and praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us together affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to the dead. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people. According to their needs, let us pray. Gracious Lord God, we thank you for the creation that you have shared with all your people. We pray that you would be a restorer of the creation that is broken. Revive the lands that are recovering from natural disasters. Protect the coastlines from the raising oceans. We pray for the people of Haiti, for the people of France, for all our friends out west where it's still dry. We pray, Lord, for your creation to sustain us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for our nation and all nations. We pray that walls would be broken down and that strangers would be one. Unite us with the whole human family. Lord, equip our leaders to deal wisely with conflict and to guide diplomats to seek peaceful solutions. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, you heal your people. Look with compassion upon us all, for those who are hurting physically, mentally, or emotionally. We pray for those who are immigrants, who are exiled, and all who are afraid or feel lost. Give rest to those who are weary. Comfort those who are grieving, and recovery to those who are ill, we pray, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord God, you nourish us here at Christ the King. You prepare a table where we receive food for our hungry spirits. Renew our commitment to provide for one another and revitalize all that we do, feeding and nurturing our hungry neighbors and neighborhoods. We pray, Lord, in your mercy. Gracious Lord God, You will always lead us home. We give thanks for all who have died, now citizens with the saints. As you have received them into your heavenly home, so welcome all of us who dwell in your house forever. Lord, in your mercy. It is into your hands, O Lord, that we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, right and our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you almighty and merciful God through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave 
and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy. was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And he gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. Peace. 
may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. shine, let it shine, let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine. Jesus gave it to me, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.